see here. Come down a little bit. thing already the clicker all right hey good morning everybody good morning. Good morning. everybody's here braving the weather you know how it is in Atlanta right yeah. when the weather gets bad everybody sleeps in I guess the traffic wasn't that bad with the weather that we have. So, but it's good to have everybody here. I've got my mic on. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. And then for those of you joining us online, welcome to another session. Today we're going to be talking about developing the right contracting strategy. There's a lot of information we're going to be going through. So I'm glad you're, you're all here. And uh, go ahead and get your seatbelt on because I'm going to go through it very fast, as fast as possible, because there's a lot of content to cover. Uh, this session is being recorded. So for those of you who are uh, trying to take notes, uh, feel free to take notes. We do have a recording and you can actually get the download. But this is what we're going to be covering today. The complexities of government contracting and developing the right strategy to be successful in the government market. So to download, go to the site here, WQ Bayer for size download, and you can download today's presentation there. Uh, on that download, I actually also have two awesome things on there, you know, the forecast for 2019. I've got uh, different forecasts on that same download page, so you got some extra bonus on there, on, the, on this uh, download page here. But let's go ahead and get into this here. So this is what we're going to be covering today. Strategies that's going to be very impactful, meaningful. If you understand these strategies here, it sets you apart for, from everybody else that's trying to do government contracting. So we're going to start off by talking about the entrepreneur's path, which is your path and my path. And all of us who are in business, we're going to be talking about the entrepreneur's path. And then we're going to be talking about the government market versus the commercial market. How is that different? Then we're going to be talking, we'll shift it to as we go to this here, beginning with the end in mind. And then we're going to go to your short-term plan, uh, which is the quickest path to money. Then we're going to talk about being a sub or being a prime contractor in the government space. Then we'll get into your long-term plans and then certification plans and which agency is right for you. Uh, talking about a large business. And when you become a large business, because that's where some of you want to be, right? Anybody plan to be a small business wherever? Nobody, right? You plan so that you can become a large company at one point. So what does it look like to be a large company? And then what's your exit plan? You have to have an exit plan before you start, right? And, and so we'll talk about that. And then your financial strategy. What do you need to have in place? to When you win contract, what do you need to have in place before that happens? Then we'll talk about your past performance, how to develop a strategy, because some of you are new, you don't have a strategy, you don't have past performance, how do you do that there? Then we'll talk about your marketing plan and your marketing strategies. We'll talk about relationship plans and, and how to build relationships in the government market. Contracting team, building a contracting team, what is that strategy and how you can build a team around you? And then we'll talk about your compliance strategies and then we'll talk about your closure strategy and then your benchmark strategies. And we'll look at a few companies that have gone out there and have done it. And so, but to dive in, let me share a little bit about myself. My name is Abraham Sion, the uh, one of the co-founders of the Government Contractor Association. 
I love business. And people ask me, hey, uh, what do you do? I tell them I'm a professional basketball player, right? And people laugh just like that, Adam. They laugh at me and say, hey, you know what? You're, you're, tall, you're just a tad taller than Spud Webb. Actually, Spud Webb is about two inches taller than me. <laughs> so, so I'm not quite there. But, uh, but I tell them that because professional athletes, they do what they have fun at. And they get paid to do what they enjoy, right? And, and so for some of you, entrepreneurship may be fun. Well, entrepreneurship might be a grind. If it's a grind, you're not gonna really see the success that, that you want until you learn to understand that this is just a game. Business is a game and there's rules to the games. And if you understand the game, you can be successful. So I love what we do here, you know, in terms of being an entrepreneur and, and helping business. This is, this is really my gift. And I get to serve the world, get paid to do it and have a lot of fun doing it. So as such, I'm a small business advocate, have been so uh, for multiple years. But I'm like you, I'm a lifelong entrepreneur. Uh, I've started multiple businesses, have sold two companies, uh, and, and then started the association using all my entrepreneurial experience to support the industry. Now, some people have asked me this question. Some of you might be wondering the same thing. Abe, if you know so much about government contracting, why don't you do government contracting yourself, right? That's a good question, right? Anybody want to know why? Because I realize in life that every one of us is born with a purpose. And yes, I can do government contracting and be very successful at that for myself and for my family, but how does that help you, right? And so I realize that my gift is sharing and teaching and empowering people and it's very rewarding when you're able to empower people. And I'll share some success stories of businesses that we have worked with. Uh, since I've been doing this here, companies have won over $900 million in government contracts. So I can go win contracts for myself and, and, and win a few million dollars for myself, or I can empower people. You know, our goal is to get to a billion dollars in government contracts. Something rewarding about that. And so I, I feel like I get to live out my purpose and, and get to live out my life in this way here, but also and, and I get to empower people in that process there. And we'll talk more about some of my reasons later on. But I'm a life entrepreneur. My first start was a baseball card comic book shop when I was about 19, 20 years old. Uh, and then I went overseas, became a missionary, came back to the US, uh, went to work for um, Fortune 500 companies, but I only lasted five months. And then I decided to start an office furniture company and grew that business with $300, turned it into $10 million worth of furniture. Now, most of you have more than $300, right? I hope so. <laughs> so when I was a young man, I had $300 to my name, and I, but I knew that I wanted to start my own business. And so I took $300 and started my own business. Now, how can you start a business with $300? Question, how can you start a business with $300? Anybody? You start where you're at, right? Or is it possible to start a business with $300? It is. And, and what I realized when I, you know, when I decided to go into business with $300, I realized that business is not about money. What is it about? What is business about? Anybody? Business is not about money. Nobody. What's it about? It's about people. When you understand that business is not about money, it's about people. It's about relationships. That's what it's about. And when I understood that. So I, I didn't, I didn't care whether I had money or not because if I understood that business is about really people and relationships and, and finding people with a problem and finding somebody else that had a solution and I connect the two. That's how I started my furniture business. And then I sold that business, got into real estate, started buying up real estate properties. Anybody in the real estate industry? Okay, a few of you, all right. So I used to flip houses, buy ugly homes, fix it up, uh, you know, wholesale properties, building communities, uh, and then 
the real estate market bust. It was the bubble burst, right, in 2007. And it was a really hard time. We lost about $20 million of all of our real estate gone in about a year. And uh, it teaches you a lot about life, teaches you a lot about who your friends are, uh, but it also teaches you what's most important in, 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 in this journey called life here. So, but I learned from, the, from that. But in that journey, I decided to do one thing. When everything was gone, my car was repo. Anybody had your car repo before? That's the journey of entrepreneurship, right? Don't raise your hand if your car's been repo. <laughs> Anybody lost your home before? We lost our home during this time here. All of our real, real estate investment, most of it gone. A personal home, gone. And in 2008, the whole year's income was $6,000 for a family of four. My wife, myself, my two kids. But I may be in a desperate situation, but guess what? I don't have to act desperate, right? I don't have to feel desperate. And it, it, it teaches you about who you are and what, and what you're about, right? So it was during this really tough time that I decided that if I really want to be an entrepreneur, I'm going to invest. And I didn't have any money to invest. So I went to the landlord of the building that I was in, and it, you know, it was my real estate office. And I went to her and I said, hey, you can kick me out or you can let me stay. And, and I'm sharing these through because it's all about strategies. It's about you thinking through your business and developing a game plan for yourself. So I thought I can close up the door, close up my doors and go home and feel sorry for myself or I invest in my business. So I went to the lady, to the leasing management and I said, hey, let me stay. So sometimes the Holy Spirit speaks for you and, and and you, you want to do something different, but the spirit speaks for you. And so in that situation, she said, okay, well, how much can you pay? Now, keep in mind, I can't even pay for my car note. They, the repo man took my car. I can't even pay for my mortgage. It's, it's in foreclosure. So how am I going to pay for office space? Should I pay for my car note or should I pay for my home before I pay for my office space, right? I did what didn't seem normal. What's normal is you pay for your car, pay for your mortgage. But I decided that I'm going to keep it office. And I had no business because real estate was dead. No, I didn't know what type of business I was going to go into. But I knew that going to home, staying at home every day, I was going to feel sorry for myself. I was going to sleep in. I was going to, the TV was going to be my best friend. And my best of friends was going to be the fridge because I was going to you know, eat everything in the fridge or whatever is left in the fridge. And so I knew that there was things that I couldn't surround myself in that I had to get up and do the routine that an entrepreneur should be doing. And so I woke up every day, went to the office with nothing to do. But it was better than sitting at home and feeling, feeling sorry for myself. So I told the, the leasing manager, I said, hey, I don't know. But the spirit spoke and the spirit said $500. Now my office, my office space was about almost $2,000, $1,700. And it was $1,700 and I told her I can pay 500. Knowing that she probably gonna, you know, what's there to lose, right? And she said, well, I can't let you stay for, for 500. I said, well, just think about it. So she thought about it. Later on, she came to the, to, to the office and said, you know, I'm gonna let you stay for $500. Now, I didn't have $500. <laughs> so what have I put myself into, right? So I took my phone and my cell phone. Back then, there wasn't the a smartphone, right? There was a flip phone. And I took out my flip phone and I had about a thousand people in my flip phone. Because as entrepreneurs, you build up a network of people. And I just started going down the phone and started calling people. And I said, hey, you know what? You're working from home. I've got an awesome office space for you. It's, you get your own private office. There's a conference room. There's a training room. Don't you need an office? They said, yeah. I've been to your office. It's awesome. He said, how much? I said, 250 And I found two people to come into the office. 250 each. They cover the lease. And I was able to come to the office. And now the only thing I need to do was 
hustle enough to get $150 to pay for the internet so that everybody can, you know, be happy. And so that's kind of how I started and, 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 you know, restarted my life again after I lost, you know, so much of, of many things in terms of property stuff. And so went through that, started, you know, but in coming to this office here, one day a stranger walked into my office and we started talking and he was a retired lieutenant colonel. He was a contracting officer. And we started talking and said, you know, hey, you know so much about business. He said, why don't we take his procurement knowledge and my business knowledge and let's start a consulting company helping business get into the government market. And so sometimes you take steps of faith, right? You, you can't, entrepreneurship is not walking by sight. It's believing in your business, seeing the future of your business before it's there. Government contracting is the same way. You can't wait until you, you, you guarantee a contract. You have to put in place and build the things that you need to do so that you can get to a place where you can get contracts. And so we started a contracting consulting business, helped a lot of business to grow. But in that process, I realized that there's a lot of small businesses that cannot afford consulting services. Because in consulting services, we charge $100,000, $200,000. A small business cannot afford that service. So after about three years doing consulting work, I realized that, you know, I have to do something different to help the really small businesses. And so in that journey, what I did was this here. I told my partner, hey, I was leaving. And this is why I left. Ladies in the room, all the ladies, raise your hand. All right, by half the room. You're not a lady? Raise your hand. There you go. All right, ladies, right? So ladies, you represent 51% of the population, almost 51% of the population. But in government contracting, women business owners are only winning about 4.6 to 5% of contracting dollars. Think about that. You represent 51% of the community, 41% of all small businesses are owned by women. But you're only winning 5% contracting dollars. Is something wrong with that picture? I mean, we talk about the Me Too movement, right? We talk about, hey, you know what? Back in the early 1900s, women, you didn't have the, the, the rights to vote. And so we come a long way from that. But when it comes to government contracting, it's like the dark ages. You, you know, women are not getting your fair share of the opportunities in there. Now guys, all the guys, never raise your hand guys. All right, I'm glad all the guys raise their hand. They know who they are at least. <laughs> but guys, if we don't stand up for the woman next to us, right? If we don't become their advocates, if we don't support them, they are our mothers, our wives, our daughters, our grandparents. They are the other half of us. And if we as men don't stand up for them, who will, right? And so we have to stand up with them and for them. And so in this journey here, I thought, who will stand up for the ladies when it comes to government contracting? And sometimes you look at yourself in the mirror long enough and you say, well, maybe that someone is me. And so that's part of the reason why I decided to leave consulting and start the Government Contractors Association. Someone has to be the voice of those who are disadvantaged, those that may not, that, that they're just as great. They just, the doors are closed for them. And so someone has to do that. And so th there are many other reasons, but that's one of the reasons why I left consulting and started the Government Contractors Association. And so GCA was formed in 2010. And since we've been here, we've helped businesses win over 900, you know, about $900 million of government contracts. All right. So that's enough about me. Let's go into what we're here for, right? Real strategies in the government market. But this is the time to get focused because these things here will change the landscape of your business. But to get into the government market, I'm going to talk about your path first, which is all of us, our entrepreneur's path. And so entrepreneurs, we, most of us start here. We start with a J-O-B, a job, right? Now, anybody still full-time working for somebody else? Anybody? Okay, that's fine. That's good. Because in your entrepreneur's path, when you're working for somebody else, that's your training ground. 
that is the training ground so that you can become uh, better and greater and you get paid to get trained, right? Isn't that awesome? Someone pays you so that you can learn the skill sets so that you can be your own boss somewhere down the road. So that's a great training ground. So when you work with somebody else, I don't look at it as, oh man, I gotta see this boss or I gotta go into here. No, it, it's a great opportunity to, for someone else to pay you and train you so that you can be a better entrepreneur down the road. So it's really your prep time. So most people, we decide, okay, you know, I wanna go from the job to the next step. And the next step is the SE quadrant, or which is a self-employed. SE stands for self-employed. So we move on to becoming self-employed. Now, when we are self-employed, guess what? The word keyword in self-employed is what? Self. It's just you. And you are a solopreneur trying to make things happen. And you're trying to make it, you know, and you're you're you know. On the front, you're looking like nice and clean, but underneath, you're like a dog just trying to pass survive. you know? I'm just trying to stay afloat. And that's entrepreneurship. And, and that's part of it. But the, the operative word is self. And so most entrepreneurs who get to this point, guess what they do? They go back, right? They get to here, they say, you know what? This is hard. You know, I, I don't know how I'm gonna pay my bills next month. And they go back to a job. Now, some make the loop back again, but some go back and say, you know what, I'm just, it's easier to clock in and get paid. I know I got a guaranteed paycheck and I have to worry about it. So it takes a lot of faith. So for all of you who have transitioned into this next sector over here, congratulations, because you are among the, the one percenters, 3% of of the US are actually medium businesses, 5% are small businesses, so you're the top 5%, and if you are full-time in your business, you're really in an exclusive club already. Because most people are in this sector here. They're working with somebody else. And again, there's nothing wrong with working with somebody else, because there's a place for everybody. Everybody has a journey in life, right? Unfortunately, many people are not happy here, but they just don't have either the faith the courage or the fortitude to move to this next sector here. But for some of you, ultimately, what we want to do is we want to get to this next sector, right? Which is the SB sector. And SB is for small business. Now, the difference between this is a small business too, this is a micro business. Self employed is a micro business because you are it. You are the president, CEO, right? But guess what? You're also the commode director. Right, you take out the trash and you you make the big bucks and all that stuff as being a self-employed. But as a small business, you have a team, and your team might be one other person, it might be an intern, it might be a secretary, it might be two of you. It might be usually it's a partner. Two or three of you come together and you form an LLC or you form a S corp and you move into this here. So you're a small business trying to make it, and then. Well, the next step is we want to get to the MS sector, which is being a mid-sized business. And here you actually have staff. You, you have payroll, you have staff, you have insurance, you, have, you start to have benefits for each other. And you start to build infrastructure. Infrastructure is your HR policies, your, you know, starting building your line of credit and all these little things, all that's part of it. And you have an office. Here, you probably work from home. Here, you may have a small office. Most people don't have a small office at this point here. But here, you definitely have an office. So you're moving down this, this journey here. And then, ultimately, the next step to this here is you want to get to the LB sector, which is the large business sector. And as a large business, you have an organization. You have staff. You have employees. And more importantly, you have systems. You put systems in place and standard operating procedures and you have policies and compliance and cybersecurity plans and you have, you know, a HR team and, and, and safety program and OSHA, you meet OSHA requirements, you have quality assurance standards and so forth. And so you get into a large business. 
Less than 1% of the businesses in the U.S. are large businesses. So if, you, if you're not here yet, don't feel bad. Just keep going your journey. But the best sector to be is this last sector here. Anybody know what this last sector is? Investor. Yes, it's the investor sector. Now in the investor sector, here, this is where you wanna be, because now money is your friend. And, and you're deploying, instead of deploying people, deploying systems, deploying partners to do work, who are you deploying? Money. You're deploying George Washington, you're deploying Benjamin Franklin, Andrew Jackson, and does, does Andrew Jackson call in sick? Your employees will, but Andrew Jackson doesn't call in sick. George Washington, does he have kids? He doesn't have kid problems. Oh, my kids are at school today and they have a high temperature. I gotta go pick them up. No, they, you don't have employee problems. You don't have people problem. They will always go work for you. So this is what it means. In this first sector here, you are employer dependent. You are dependent upon an employer. In this second sector, you are self-dependent. You can only depend on yourself. On this next sector, you're team dependent, you're you and your partners. And in this next sector, you're staff dependent, depending upon a few staff. And then large business, you're systems dependent. At this point here, you depend on a system. And what I mean by system is this here. Think about McDonald's and think about some of some of you who worked in fast food in the past or some of you who may have teenagers. You take a high school teenager who cannot clean up their room and you put them at McDonald's and McDonald's successful. What's the answer? No. Yes. 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 You take a high school student who is a total wreck, won't get up on time, won't comb their hair, don't clean up their room not doing well in school, and you put the same person at McDonald's and McDonald's is profitable and successful. Why is that? McDonald's have a system. They're not people dependent. They're system dependent. And so what they do is they take the same teenager and they put this teenager and they, the first day they said, today I'm going to train you on the French fry station. And when you see that the fries are cold or it's out, I want you to go to the freezer, cut, cut the bag of fries, put it into the tray, put it down, hit this green button, and in three minutes, it's gonna go ding, the red button's gonna come off, and when you hear the ding, make sure you take it out. Don't wait 30 seconds, don't wait two minutes. Take it out and put it here, let it drain for a second, and then throw it into this tray, throw some salt on there, put it in the cup and, and, or into the holder and give it to the customer. That's it. That's all they trained them on. It's a system. So when you become a large business, you have systems and you're no longer dependent on people. And in a, in, a, in a large business, do you have to show up to work? No. You're the CEO, right, of your own company. You're system dependent anymore. And if you go on a one week vacation, someone's answering the phone. Everything's taken here. You go on the vacation, the phone rings, who, who answers the phone? You're answering the phone while you're on vacation. <laughs> or you don't have business the next week you come back. So, so, so this is very different. And then here, money, money dependent. Your work, money is working for you. So that's really where you want to get to. And this is a young lady, Tasha. She's kind of going through her journey. And, and she started off being an employee. She decided that she wanted to start her own business. And then she started to uh, build her infrastructure and she became self-employed, working by herself. And then she got to a point where she said, hey, you know what? I got a partner. Then now she's got a small team of people, right? Am I right? Small team of people. So, so she's moved from one sector to another sector to another sector. And, and then she's gonna continue to move through this journey here to becoming a large company. All right, so now let's talk about some strategies. Let's talk about the first thing I want to share with you is, you know, as you're walking your journey, your entrepreneur's journey in the government market, you have to understand that it's different. The government market is very different from the commercial sector. Let's talk about what are some of these differences. It's a different language. 
you have to learn governance. Governance is what? The language of contracting. It's the contracting language. It's how you do business in the government market. You have to speak governance, and governance is acronyms and the FAR. Anybody knows what the FAR stands for? Federal Acquisition Regulation. That's the contracting Bible. And if you don't know the FAR, you might want to get to know the FAR, right? And so you have to learn this new language and you have to understand uh, what is SAP? Simplified Acquisition Procedures, right? And, and what does SAP mean? So that's the definite, that's the word for it, but what does it mean? Yes. Exactly. So there's SAPs for, there's different types of SAPs. There's simplified acquisition procedures for Lockheed Martin. Because if they're building a missile defense system, uh, they're going to say, hey, this is a SAP and it's going to Lockheed Martin and we're not going to put it up for bid. Or at SAP, they have SAP for small businesses, then that's what's important to you, right? What are our SAPs for small businesses? And the SAPs for small businesses is any contract less than $150,000 must go to small businesses. Did you know that? Now, the new regulation just came out and says that for most agencies, they're shifting that to $250,000. So it's no longer just $150,000. But the threshold now, some agents, some agents are still under one hundred fifty thousand. But most agencies are moving to two hundred fifty thousand. So if you're bidding on a project and it's less than two hundred fifty thousand, and you see that this is a small business set aside, guess what? Large companies cannot bid on it. And so understanding governance is very important. These jar these these jargons and, and verbiage and so forth. All right, any game of fans thrown? I mean, Game of Thrones fans, raise your hand. Who can't wait for the season to come on? I can't wait. I mean, last season, right? Yeah. This is the last season. We're going to see some dragon breathe some fire on people, and, and people is going to turn to ashes. Death to the to the death to the, what the dead walkers is that what they're called? <laughs> white walkers. Death to the white walkers, right? But in this TV show here. They have their own language. So Valerian is one of the languages spoken on, on set in the, in the show. And they have over 667 words that they use. And you can actually translate English into Valerian. It's a made up language. But people actually learn, the actors and actresses learn this language to portray these characters on them. Right? Show Ise se Galibo. Me show me the money. Right? And then the Raki, they actually have 3,163 words. So if this is make believe, they can learn a language, a made up language. Should you learn the language of contracting? And it's not that hard. You just have to immerse yourself into it. Right? Alright, so Pam's been around me long enough. She's, she's speaking Hmong now. <laughs> So Hmong is the language that I speak. I grew up in Laos. Uh, it's a very small ethnic group. Uh, there's about 12 million of us around the world. Uh, the bulk of Hmong lives in China. A few Hmong lives, about 300,000 lives in Laos, about 150,000 lives in the US. And so, but, so, so we have a very you know, small group of people that speak this language here. And what I said to you is that you as a small business, you understand two or three words here and there, right? Because I kind of, because in our language, it's easier to say the English word than our native language. So I said that you as a small business owner, you're here today, you want to learn about government contracting. I happen to, in fact, work for the government. And if you raise your hand, I will so source you a contract today. But no one raised their hand, right? So you got to learn the language. You got to learn to speak this language. 
and that has happened. One of the companies I'm working with, they went to a GDOT event, Georgia Department of Transportation event. Now, DOT, you're thinking construction, right? But this is an IT company. And so, so he went to this GDOT event and he's an IT company. And so in that conversation, the at the end, after they talked about all the construction projects, the lady who was sharing about all the all the projects that uh, that uh, that is tied to GDOT, she said, anybody in IT, in, in the whole room of hundreds of people, he was the only hands that went up. And she says, I got a sole source project for you. So sometimes, you know, being around, immersing yourself, being at the right place at the right time can get you a project. And when I talk about language and other things that, uh, let me show you this. Uh, this is my family here. This is our mom outfit here, right? The cultural outfit. And uh, makes me look handsome with this beautiful outfit here. But other than that, you guys just think I'm just an average guy. But put me in my mom outfit, I'm Superman. <laughs> now, the other thing that's different in the government market is the writing is different. If you're used to uh, technical writing, used to bids in the commercial market, there's not a lot of details and it's very simple in the commercial market. And the government market is very, the bidding process, the proposal, the solicitation process is very different. So you have to learn that. It's a different world in that regard. Uh, today, I can go to all those details because there's just too much to teach you proposal writing in the strategy session. But you have to understand that it's very different. The culture is different, right? The culture is different in this way here. Now imagine that you're trying to do business in Japan or, in, or how about China? You're trying to do business in China. Anybody speak Mandarin or Cantonese or any of the ethnic language over there? And, but you want to do business over there. So, so one, you have to learn the language. That's given, right? But the other thing is you have to understand that the culture is different. There's the unwritten rule, right? Part of the culture in, in China and in most developing nations is when you go do business over there, you have to have two stack of money. One stack here, another stack under the table. There's a lot of bribery that goes on. And if you understand the culture, I don't do business in China because I don't want to bribe people. When you're bribing people, you get the deals. But when they're unhappy with you, guess what? They turn you in and send you to jail. So I just don't want to mess in that culture. So you have to think about different cultures and how it's done. And if you're willing to change your ways with those cultures, now, good thing is in the government market, bribing is not part of the culture, right? <laughs> in fact, bribing, you go to jail in the government market. So, so, so I'm not talking about that culture there. But I'm, my point is that the culture is different. And let me give you a real culture difference here. In the, in the South, when my wife invites you over for dinner and she's, she cooked this awesome meal and you're, we're sitting down to eat, the culture here in the South is clean your plate, right? Eat everything, right? And that tells her that, man, the food was awesome. She was the bomb. And without saying anything, just by cleaning your plate, you're telling her that it was awesome. But in China, guess what? If you clean your plate, you know what that says? Because the culture is different. What does it say? If you clean your plate, it says that you're still hungry. So you're trying to, you're trying to tell the, the, the Chinese host, the guest that, that provided dinner for you, and you're trying to tell them, hey, man, the food's awesome. You clean your plate. And they're feeling bad because they feel like my guest is still hungry. I got to go get some more food. And they will come and they pour more food into your plate. And so you're eating, you're cleaning your plate because you don't think, you didn't understand that, right? You don't understand the culture. So you clean your plate, trying to tell them that you're full. But then they're thinking like, oh, my guest is still hungry. So they pour you more food and then they run out of food and they think, oh man, we feel bad because our guest is still hungry and we don't have enough food for our guests. And now you're overstuffed. And you just to understand the cultural differences. So in the government market, it's different. And, and I'll share to more of some of the examples of how different it is. 
This is two different cultures, right? In the West, we said everything covered but her eyes. What a cruel male-dominated culture, right? <laughs> That's the Western culture. Now, in, in certain Middle Eastern nations, nothing covered but her eyes. What a cruel male-dominated culture. Very, it's perspective. So there's a lot of differences. Philosophy is, your, your contracting philosophy has to be different also. In the commercial sector, being a specialist is actually good. You get paid a lot of money being a specialist in the commercial sector. In the government market, being a generalist is actually better. So a generalist is a general contractor, whereas a specialist is a plumber. If you, as an individual, you want to make money, you have a better chance by being a plumber than being a general contractor. Because a general contractor, you need a team around you. Whereas this thing, you just go out there and do it on your own. Right. But in the government market, they award, they bundle contracts together and they award it to one company because they don't want to manage the plumber, the electrician, the roofer, the brick masonry person, the pavement company. They'd rather award it to one company, the general contractor, and then let you manage all the subs. So that's a little bit different. So some of you, you are specialists in the commercial. You're transferring into the government market. Now it, now it impacts your strategy. So if you don't want to be a generalist, so you're, you have two choices. Stay a specialist or become a generalist. And you say, you know what? I don't necessarily want to be a generalist because that means I have to learn new things. I just want to do what I'm good at. So if you want to stay as a plumber, then you have to understand that in the government market, your strategy is different in this way. You most likely, 80% of the time, you're just going to be a subcontractor. You're going to be a subcontractor to a generalist, the general contractor. Or if you, if you, or you change your strategy, you say, you know what, I may be an investigative company only, but I'm going to reposition my company and be more of an administrative management company uh, or a, a human capital company. I'm going to become more of you know, because researching people, investigating people, it's all—it's about background investigation. Well, you're already researching people. You can turn that skill set and research qualified candidates and get into the staffing business. So there's different things you can take. Take your skill set and do that. When Tasha first started, she was a construction company. The lady that I shared earlier, she was a construction company. And so I, we talked and I said, Tasha, you know, construction is awesome. But since you're getting your 8A, you might want to reposition your company so that you can do more than just construction. Now, that's not right for everybody. You have to determine what's the best strategy for you. So what Tasha did was she said, yeah, you know what? And so we repositioned her as visionary services. And one of her larger contract was a $3.1 million contract. And it was not in construction. It was in security guards. Security guards, she... She doesn't, I don't think Tasha owns a gun. She probably never fired a gun before. She doesn't have a security guard license to even operate a security guard company. But how is, she, how is that she's able to win a security guard contract? It's called teaming and partnership and so forth. And that's one of the strategies we'll talk about in a second. But she became more of a generalist so she can do more things in the government market. But it depends on you, depend on which strategy you want to yeah, employ. As a journalist, you can go after many more contracts. As a specialist, you have to do a lot of more subbing and teaming. All right. The most important word, this is a very important strategy here, is the word control. And it goes back to being a generalist. Government contracting is about winning contracts. It's, it's less about performing on the contracts. The most important lesson that you can learn is how to win a contract. And winning a contract is controlling a contract itself. So your main goal is learning how to control a deal, control the project itself. When you control the project, guess what you control? You control the money, right? And when you control the money, you can hire anybody to do the work. So your main goal is to win the contract. Now, don't get me wrong. Performance is 
utmost crucial because if you win a contract and you can't deliver and perform on it, you will get, you know, you will not do any more government work because you can get blacklisted. But you need teaming partners and subs and so forth to do it for you. But the most important thing is learning how to control the deals. And if you control the deals, you can control you can control the money, you can control the, the subs and any any type of project you're willing to learn and expand, you can get into. And so that's that's a very important strategy. Relationship building is different. And we'll we'll come back to relationship in a second. Marketing is different. Capability statement, you'll need a marketing collateral. You don't use brochures in the government market. So it's a different strategy, different techniques that you have to use. You, you use a capability brief, which is a PowerPoint presentation. You need a capability video. More people is accessing your information through videos. And when you send a capability statement, uh, 2016, the world shifted over to accessing the internet from the phone more so than from a desktop or laptop. So more people are accessing your information from their cell phone now. So as such, it's easier to push a play button versus trying to look at your capability statement. Now you need both, but having a capability, uh, capability video sets you apart from everybody else. And all it is is your capability statement verbalized with some graphics into a video. And that's as simple as I can explain what the capability video is, but it should be only about a minute to a minute and a half, no more than two minutes. You need to have a government friendly website. Your website have to speak governees, have to speak to your audience. And your business card needs to speak to the audience as well. And so in your business card, it needs to have your guns number. It needs to have your NAICS code. It needs to have you know, your certifications on there. And utilize, so your business card is your mini capability statement. Think of it that way. It's your mini capability statement and you use that to get to people. So these are some things that you need to think of. All right, let's go on to the next strategy. Begin with the end in mind. This is what the end should look like for you. And I can't go into all these details of what the end needs to look like, but I can I give you a quick highlight of what it should look like. So from your perspective, you gotta go through 12 steps. Preparation, assessment of your business, strategy, education, registration, and then go through promotion phase, your image, your marketing, your relationship strategies, Go through the proposal phase, writing for final opportunities, writing proposals, and then performing on it, which is delivering the service, staying compliance, and closing up the project. You can go through that. From our perspective, we help you through all those. And then from a government perspective, they have their methodologies and their process that they go through. They go through a need, a budget, a forecast, and they go through a market survey. This is where sole source contracts are won at this stage here. And then they go through the proposal phase where they put out solicitation. Uh, they take, receive your proposal and then they award a contract. And then performance is where they manage the work that you do for their on, on their base, military facilities. Their goal is project completion. Your goal is profit. Very different. Now, our goal for you is to go to professional contracting department. And so that's what we're trying to help you to build. But that is what the end should look like. You need to have all these things in place and understand all these different moving components here. Now let's talk about your short-term strategy. Your short-term strategy is your quickest path to money, right? Because as a small business, you don't have three years to try to win your first contract. In fact, that's about the average time it takes companies to break into the government market, 36 months. As a small business, you have three months. <laughs> or maybe six months if you really stretch it. But you know, most small business, you're, you're, you're operating month to month to month to month. And you're trying like, hey, I just need to make enough revenue so I can pay the bills this month, so I can make more money, to pay the bill next month, so that I can survive until I get bigger and bigger and to where I can actually have a reserve of six months, 12 months, and so forth. So you got to understand what's the shortest path to money. And so to do that, you, there's two things you have to consider. Open competition and set aside opportunities. Open competition is competing in the open market, which is 77% of all the projects out there. The other strategy is, okay, 
set aside. Set asides are for small businesses only. And for set asides, 23% of all contracting dollars are awarded to small businesses or must be awarded to small businesses. And so set aside to who? Businesses that have different certifications. Hub Zone, 8A, WSB, EDWSB, BOSB, many, many other certifications. And then a large company, when they win contracts, they are required to subcontract to small businesses. So if you understand this, this flow chart here, then what you have to do is understand this here. Do you, be, do you want to be a client and do direct work with the government, or should you be a subcontractor and do work with large primes, large companies out there? Now the two, which is the easier path? Sub is a lot easier. Because as a sub, you don't, you're not required to meet all the regulations and all the standards that the government has. You only have to do some of it, the ones that the large company mandates that you have to meet. So this is an easier path. Uh -huh. Well, I have a question about that. So if, with the large businesses, when they win the contract, do they have to identify the small business at the time of bid, or can they do it after they already have awarded the contract? The smart, large companies that are actively doing work in the government market, they actually do it before. The large company that are strong, the commercial and the transitioning to the government market, they don't understand, so they try to do it after. And I'm gonna share with you more details about what you need to look like when you're a large company in a second. So that's a good question. So sub is usually a lot easier, but being a prime is also important. I tell you, you know, my, my, what I share with most of the companies I work with is start off being a sub, why you're putting in place all your infrastructure in the government market. So do that in that and simultaneously, but not necessarily pursuing contracts. Prime is not your first thing you do. Start doing sub work first so you can build path performance in that part of it. All right, so if you if part of the strategy is to do small business set aside projects, what certification should you get, right? There's a whole bunch of certifications out there. Should you get federal certifications? Should you get state certifications, county certifications, city certifications, or commercial certifications? What are some commercial certifications out there? Anybody? DBE. DB, not commercial. MBE. MBE, yes, commercial. is. That's the main one, MBE. There's also the uh, WBE, WBE with uh, WeBank. MBE in the state of Georgia is with GMSDC. So those are commercial certifications. So if you want to do work for Coca-Cola, you want to do work for at and you want to do work for Home Depot, they utilize those type of certifications. Now for city, city of Atlanta certification, what do they have? They don't have DBE, but good guess. City of Atlanta, they have AABE, what does is, what is AAB stand for? African American Business Prize. They also have FBE, which what is? Female Business Prize. They have APABE, Asian Pacific American Business Prize. They have, they have um, the other one they have is HABE, which is Hispanic. Hispanic. All right, you guys speaking Governor that's good. Now, county level, DeKalb County has what? Which, what's their certification? LSBE, which stands for Local Small Business Enterprise. Gwinnett County, what certification do they have? We don't have any. Oh, that was a trick question. Good answer. <laughs> Gwinnett County does not have any certifications. Now, why do you think they don't have certifications? Why does Gwinnett not have certification? There's a lot of you know, it's very diverse there. Yeah, why? Who lives in Gwinnett County? Anybody live in Gwinnett County? Just me? Okay, everybody else outside. Because we clinicians are not pushing for our legislators to create programs for us. And it all happens at the legislative process. And so Gwinnett is very diverse. In fact, Gwinnett is more, there's a lot of, a lot of minorities there but there's not a minority certification program. 
And so it's really about politics in some degree. So cop, which certification does cop have? None. Good answer. What certification does Clayton County have? Who? Clayton County. Clayton. They have certifications. Yeah, which one? MBA? No, they have the SLBE. The small local business. <laughs> they reverse the cab, right? The cab is LSBE, claim is SLBE. Fulton County, what do they have? Fulton County has um, yes, several certifications. What is the name? They have two MFBE, which is really two separate certifications, but they kind of blend it as one. MFBE is Minority Business Enterprise or Female Business Enterprise. You could be one or the other, but that's their certification program. So, so depending on where you want to work, right? Now, state, state of Georgia, what did they have? You said earlier, DBE, which is Disadvantaged Business Enterprise. The airport, what certifications do they have? ACDBE. MARTA, what do they have? DBE. DBE, but it's their own DBE. It's not the state DBE, yes. but it's, they have their own DBE process now. So there's all these different state, local, city, you know, commercial, and then federal certifications. The top federal certification is the 8A program. That's the strongest one. Don't worry what the SBA says. SBA says all certifications are equal in the federal space, but they're not equal. In reality, they're not equal. So just, just kind of go go assume that there's some truth to that through my experiences. So just believe that, that the best certification program you can have is the 8A. The next best one is the SDBOSB, Service Disabled Veteran Small Business. The third one is Hub Zone. Anybody live in a Hub Zone? Okay, good. If your business is in a hub, you know, if you set your home as your business office also then you can get certified as a, because you live there, so you meet the 35% requirement. 35% of your employees must be in a hub zone. Are you the only person in your company or you have multiple people? Okay, so you need to go to the hub zone map, put up your employees, address, make sure that they live in a hub zone. 35% of your staff must be in a hub zone, you included. So if you do that, you can be in a hub zone. Get a hub zone certification. Awesome. <laughs> Congratulations. Great job. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Now, when you are hiring people, make sure that you you want to hire people in a hub zone, but don't do it where they, they will report you to EEOC. Because that's, you know, <laughs> you can't discriminate from in terms of where they live. Now, you can encourage them to move, but their job is not dependent on whether they move or not. And so. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, federal hub zone and then women owned business uh, WSB. The EDWSB is better than the WSB. So, if you have an option between the EDWSB or the WSB, do the EDWSB. It's, it's dependent upon your next code. And so if your next code is in the in the industry that's WSB also, you might want to consider changing your next code into another industry that is the same, but it's just a, it falls into a different category. Wait, so then if your next code is in. Your next code determines whether you're WSB or EDWSB. Oh, okay. So what you want to do is you want to find your next code, make sure that your primary next code is from the list of EDWSB and not WSB. So that's part of strategy, right? Yeah, make sure you have the right next code. That's for the WSB for women owned small business. So there's the economically disadvantaged women owned small business, which is all, these are federal. Um, yeah, there's a commercial, you know, WBE, which is women business enterprise, that's for commercial purposes. And they don't care about next code in that. If you wake up and you are a woman and you're still a woman, you're good. All right. 
Now, if we look at certified companies in Georgia, Hubzone, 167. That's it. Not many. 8A companies, 267. Now, if you look at, you know, minority-owned businesses, there's not a lot of Native Americans here in Hawaii, so I didn't even add these numbers here. But, you know, you look at it, 262,000 minority-owned businesses in Georgia, and there's only 267. That's it. A handful. There's more NFL players than there are 8A companies in Georgia. Did you know that? Say it again. There's more NFL players than there are 8A companies in the state of Georgia. NFL players, when they are born, they start carrying the ball and they play football all throughout their career until they finish college just so that they can get drafted into the NFL. 21, 22 years of prep. To get into the 8A program, how many years of prep? About two to three years. That's it. Usually you have to be in business for two years before you can apply for the 8A. And then it takes about six months or 12 months to get approved. That's it. Three years of prep so that you can be in your, you, you, you and your company can be multi-millionaires. Three years of prep versus a career of 22 years to play in a league of your own. 8A is the strongest. Why is 8A the strongest? But they have set aside for women on veteran hub zone. So set aside is, is one of the reasons, but it's not the main reason. Excuse me? Yeah, it is one of the certification that contracting officers are the most comfortable using. Because the regulation has been used over you know since the 70s, you know, 80s. They almost got, got rid of it in the 80s. Um, but yeah, it's the most widely used. And the number one reason is sole source contracts. You can get sole source contracts, which is the most important strategy as a business. There's federal, state, local, cities, counties, commercial. 80% of what we teach here is how to do federal contracting dollars. How to do federal contracting work. And the reason for that is because sole source threshold at the federal level is $4 million for 8A companies. Now, some of you were here last night. Uh, one of the ladies, Barbara Story, she came and shared how she got a $3.7 million sole source contract. And so she went through, she was a member, went through a training program and eventually got her $3.7 million sole source contract. And she was sharing her experience in doing that there. And we, we spend time teaching you because the threshold is a lot higher. In a social source contract, it's a direct award to one company. You don't have to bid against anybody else. You build a relationship and there's trust. And if the agency, the contract officer trusts you that, and believe that you can do the work, then they will sole source you the contract and you don't have to bid. How beautiful is that, right? Uh huh. So what do you get? no longer eligible for 8A, right? Because now you don't need... No, you, the 8A program is nine years. And so you can get as many social contracts as you want. Right, but like, isn't there like a requirement for 8A? Like you can't have more than 275 dollars No. Uh, there's, there's, there's three ways of, of how you grow out of the 8A program. Actually, four ways. So the first, first way of how you grow out of the 8A program is nine years past. And regardless of how much you want, you're out of the program. The second way of how you get, get out of the graduate out of the 8A program is that if your NAICS code, your primary NAICS code is $27.5 million, that's the threshold of your NAICS code, and you make more revenue than 27, three years average more than that, then you graduate out of the 8A program. So you can graduate through revenue, too much revenue, and then the third way of how you graduate is if your revenue gets to $100 million while you're in the 8 program, then you graduate out of the 8 program. And then the fourth way is what? You just mess up. You mess up and they kick you out of the program. And so you don't want to get kicked out of the program. Now, I think what you're addressing is more of the first, there's two, uh, in the nine-year program, there's two cycles. The first five years, you can get all the social you want. 
the, the last four years of your 8A program, they want you to do some commercial work. They want you to do non sole source contract also, competitive bids and so forth. And so, so they do have that in the, the final four years of your eight, of the 8A program. Because what they don't want you to do is just get sole source contract because the whole 8A program is called 8A Business Development Program. That's the official name of the program. It's meant to develop your business so that you can mature and grow and, and compete, not necessarily just get you know, sole source contracts. Anybody know the history of the 8A program? So there's a guy, this is one of the unsung heroes in African American history. Now, do you think the U.S. government will ever pay restitutions for all the heritage, in terms of all, the, all, all those that, if, you were, if your heritage is that your great ancestors were brought here as slaves? Nope. Do you think they're going to ever make restitution for that? No. Nope. Nope. This is the closest thing to restitution, which is not a restitution program, but it's the closest thing to it. So, so it's contracts through the 8A program. But in the 70s, this African-American gentleman by the name of Perry Mitchell, he was uh, very influential in the African com community. And he was a Democrat, but he helped a Republican get elected to office and by the name of Richard Nixon. Now, Richard Nixon, there's a lot of good things about him and there's a lot of bad things about him. And so, but one of the good things that happened with Richard Nixon, as much as whether you like him or hate him, everybody in the minority community owe Richard Nixon a, a gratitude because it was Richard Nixon that implemented the 8 program. But it wasn't because he wanted to implement the program. He was grateful for Perry Mitchell for you know, being a voice in the African-American community. He said, hey, Perrin, what can I do for you? Uh, would you like to be in my cabinet? Would you like to be an ambassador? What, what do you want? And Perry Mitchell said, I want $100 million. No, he didn't say that. He didn't say, hey, put me, make me, give me this title. He didn't ask for any of those things. He said, you know what? Mr. President, what I want is, I want you to do good for the African-American community. And he said, I want you to take all these federal contracting dollars and I want you to implement a program that these agencies must use minority-owned businesses. And that's the basis of the 8 program. Now, back in the days, the 8 program had no nine-year term life. So you could be 8 for 25 years, 30 years. So there was no nine-year initiative. In fact, I met a gentleman, he's retired now, he lives down the road from here, and he's, you know, we got a chance to meet and talk a little bit. He shared me about his 8 journey. And it is 8 he was in the 8 program for 20, 21 years. Wow. And he's made his millions and millions in the 8 program early back in the day, so. But very awesome program. And let's keep going, because there's lots more to talk about. But you guys get the point. Uh, all right, next strategy. Which agency to work for, right? Lots and lots of agencies wow. out there. <laughs> so coming back to it, right? So there's federal agencies, hundreds of federal agencies and sub-agencies, and then states. There's 50 states out there. Counties. Over 3,000 counties in the U.S. Which county do you do work for? Do you do work for Fulton, for DeKalb, for Gwinnett, for Cobb? What about which city? If you live in Macon, do you do work for the city of Macon? Do you do work in the city of Atlanta? Even I live in Duluth. Do I do work for the city of Atlanta? You know, you have to consider all of that. There's over 35,000 cities out there. Which agents, which of those cities or agency you want to work with? All together, there's 85,000 agencies. It's a nightmare. It's a lot of agencies. So my suggestion, the best strategy for you is this here. 70% of your effort should be in the federal. There's no right or wrong, but this is just my suggestion to you. 70% of all your effort should be in the federal. You should focus in the one state that your business is based out of. Don't worry about Alabama, South Carolina, Florida for now. Just focus in Georgia, since you're in Georgia. Now, for some of you who's online, who's in a different state, 
focus in the state that you're on, you're in. And then in terms of county, focus in the county that your business is headquartered in. And then in, the, in terms of cities, two cities. The city that your business is located in and Atlanta, downtown, you know, city of Atlanta itself. So those are, that's how I would, you know, and so between the 30%, 70% of your energy, federal, and the 30% is split between state, county, cities, as it relates to government contracting. Now, keep doing your commercial work. I'm not addressing commercial in this statement here, but if you have, if you want to dedicate 20 hours a week, because you're, you're running your business 40 hours, as an entrepreneur, you're probably running your business 70, 80 hours a week. But if you're spending, let's assume you're working 80 hours as an entrepreneur. If you're spending 40 hours for your commercial business, then the 40 hours that you're doing for government, 70% of that should be federal and 30% split between these three areas. Here. Does it make sense? Yeah. All right. Now let's talk about your long-term strategy. So with your long-term strategy, it's about the most sustainable path. So what happens when you're no longer a Chihuahua and you become a Great Dane, right? Mm -hmm. And you become from a small business to where you're a large company. Or you, you start off with your, your certification or your small business certification, but now you, you graduate out of the 8 program. What do you do? What do you do when you graduate out of your certification? You're no longer a small business or you graduate by nine years. So let's talk about those things there. So as a large business, you got to think Put, start to put these things in place ahead of time, right? As a large business, you got to think through what kind of small business program do I need to have? Sometimes we call that diversity program. Oftentimes it might be called inclusion program. So as a small business, you want to start thinking about that. Now, from a small business perspective, you want to get tied into the large company and their small business program and their inclusion program, their diversity program. But you need to learn that because you, it's the same thing that you're that you're you know being part of. You need to implement that in your own company. So one of the companies I was working with, they they do uh, a lot of the contract was administrative management contracts, and they started creating a conference. And they were doing, they're like two, three million dollars a year when they started their, their conference. So they were doing a administrative management conference to where all the people who are administrative management, secretaries, office managers, and all these people that manage offices, they all come to, you know, many of them come to this little, to this little conference that this company put up, small business put up. And they come and they talk about, you know, how to be a better, you know, more effective, you know, administrative manager, you know, how to make sure that, you know, the CEO that you're, as a secretary, the CEO that you're working with, how to make sure that they're happy with your production, your work, and, and, and how to engage and so forth. They, they're, they're teaching and training people how to do that. But that small business conference that they put on serves in two, two, two ways. One is these small companies or these small individuals, these individual becomes part of the portfolio. And so when they get government contract, now they have a database of people that they can hire to put on projects. So that serves in that purpose. The second is these people that, that's coming to the conference, some of them can be subcontractors to them. And some of them can eventually, when they become a large company, these companies can be part of the small business program. And so they're using their, their thinking down the road. So that's part of it. Now you asked a question earlier about a large company and how to engage large company. You engage them through diversity inclusion program by using commercial certifications uh, for commercial contracts or government certification for government contracts, but you wanna be included in their small business program. So you usually, if you're working with Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, any of the large federal contractor, they require that you go and register in their website to be in, to be, sometimes they call it being a subcontractor with them. Or sometimes they just say, hey, get included in our diversity program. And you go through that process. Once you register, then you can start marketing to them. If you, if you have not registered to be a vendor with these large company, don't even start marketing with them. Because when you talk to them, they say, oh, the first thing you need to do is register to be a vendor with us. So start there first. But when you talk to them and they say, well, 
register as a veteran. You say, oh yeah, I've already done that. That's why I'm reaching out to you so that I can you know, share with you what we can do and how we can support your projects. And so, so that, that's a good way it is. Now, as a part of the small business program, the ideal scenario is when they are submitting a proposal, the large company, the smart large companies, they actually, you know, because the requirement is 35% must be subcontracted out to small businesses. So the large company, what they do is they say, yeah, we've got 8% of our contracting will go to women-owned businesses. And these are the women companies. And this is the team agreements that we have with these women-owned businesses. That's part of this proposal that we're submitting. And then 6%, uh, we're going to sub, sub it out to 8 a companies. And these are the 8 a companies. This is our team agreement with this proposal. And then, you know, 3% is better owned and 3% is hubs owned. And then our small business vendors make up the rest, which comes out to 60% of all of our subcontracting initiatives. And that's part of the proposal that they submit. And so that's usually the best way of how you get tied into a large company to be included in the proposal process. Now, if you wait until a project is, has been awarded, then they may or may not use you. But if you're, if you're, if you're part of the team, then 99% of the time they will use you because the contract was awarded based upon the, the whole team uh, and the whole strength of everybody that's part of the proposal. So that's, that's really the best way to do it. Then you gotta think through exit strategy, right? As a small business now, most of you are not thinking, what do I wanna, you know, what do I want my company to look like when we grow up? You're not thinking how you're gonna look like when you're a large company, and you're not thinking about your, your exit strategy because uh, when we're young, we're, we think we're immortal. We're just gonna live forever. <laughs> so we don't think about retirement. We don't think about you know being grandma, being grandpa. We don't think about you know, our exit plan, life insurance. <laughs> but your business needs to have an exit plan also. So a few things about your business. Are you gonna sell your business? Are you building it so that you can sell your business? That's one of your exit strategy. And if you are going to sell it, why would somebody else buy your company? Why? Why would they buy your company? Because most of the time as a small business, you are the company, right? That's really a weakness. When your business, you are the business, then that's a weakness. You, what that means is that you never went from self-employed to being a small business, to being a medium-sized business, to being a large company. So you have to move to the small business or at least a medium sized business and have infrastructure in place. That's why they're going to buy you. If you're not there, it's very tough for someone to buy you. Now they buy you for a few reasons. One, they buy you because you have a team of people. They're buying the expertise that you have. You have a proposal writer, you have a relationship, a capture manager who's out there building a relationship for your company. They're buying you for that purpose. And, and so that's part of the reason why they're buying you. The other is they're buying you because you have contracts with the agency that they want to be in. So for example, there's a company that does exactly what you do, but they're out in California and they want to expand to the Southeast. So instead of setting up a new office and you know coming and starting from the ground here, they'd rather come and buy a small business already established with the CDC, with Fort, Fort Benning, Fort Bragg, I mean not Fort Bragg, Fort Benning, uh, Fort Gordon, and so forth. Because now you have a presence in the Southeast. They're buying you because of the contracts that you have, and then they're also buying you because of the relationships that you have. So those are some of the reasons. Now that's not all, the, some of them buy you because of the revenue, but it's not usually revenue that they're buying. They're buying, because revenue can end, right? But these things don't end. These things keep on giving. So they're buying you for the contracts you have in place, relationship, and the team that you have. And so if you want to sell your business, you got to think in that direction. They're not buying you because you're exiting the company. Or do you want to build your exit plan as a legacy plan? And you want to build your company and leave it to your children. And you want to leave it to your family. If your kids don't want to work with you in the business, do you think you have a chance of building a legacy company? No, no. probably not. Because if they're, they have no interest, you're a farmer, but your kids live in the city. Close this out.
So you're a farmer and you want to you know, leave your farm to your kids. And guess what? You think your, your kids, they, do you think they want to milk a cow? Do you think they want to uh, drive a tractor? Not for fun, but for every day? Now Adam's raising his hands, he, he will. <laughs> I know, Adam will, but uh, most of us, we're not wired to be farmers, right? <laughs> so it all comes back down to your legacy. So if you do want to leave a legacy, you start grooming your kids, bringing them into the business, uh, having a, a shadow day, right? Say, so, hey, you know, even they're young, so say, today is shadow day. I, I want you to be a young CEO. I want you to come and see mommy being a CEO today. And you plant those seeds in them so that they can want to do those things there. And then, or your plan is, hey, you know what? I want to make all the money I want and then I'm going to close down the company. That's the other exit strategy. Most of the time, legacy or sell, right? Who wants to sell their business? All right, good. And who wants to build a legacy and leave it to their kids? And then who, Adam, you want to do both, huh? I want to do both. Okay. <laughs> and then who says, you know what? Forget the kids. I'm just going to work, make all my millions, and I'm going to close down the company. Anybody? Anybody in that situation? Oh, nobody. Okay. So this is not an option then. You need to have a financial strategy. And your financial strategy is you got to plan ahead when you win a contract. Because you will win a contract. It's not if you're going to win a contract, it's when you win a contract. So when you win a contract, what happens, right? If you wait until you win a contract before you have a financial strategy, it's too late. I had a company. We helped them win a $1.2 million contract in Birmingham, Alabama. And back then, I didn't tell them to have a financial strategy. <laughs> now I know to say, you got to have a financial strategy. So they want a $1.2 million contract, and then the agency said, okay, get started on the project. They said, well, it takes $100,000 for me to get started on this project, and I don't have the money. Well, the government's not going to write you a check to start on a project. They're going to say, hey, you know, you want it. God bless you. Go get it going, you know? And so he didn't have the money. So now I always ask and I, I always tell you, you gotta have a financial plan. Generally, you need about 20%. If you win a $100,000 project, you need about $20,000 to get started on your project. And if you don't have that, don't bid on a $100,000 project. And, I, and I'll share with you some ways of how you can do that in a second. Now, if you're in the products, and you're not in the service industry, you're in the products business, you have to buy the products first, deliver it to the government, then they, you invoice them, then they pay you. And that could be 30 to 60 days. So you need a plan. Don't go for a million dollar project to say, hey, we won, but that's gonna be your worst nightmare, okay? <laughs> But so what do you do? You got to start looking at your personal credit score. That's the easiest place to start, your personal credit score. If your credit score is 650, then start moving it towards 700, 750, 800. Don't be ashamed of your credit score if it's lower than 600. It's just a number. Don't worry about it. Work on it and get it back to where it needs to be. Credit Karma is free. Set up a free account with them. They pull from TransUnion and from Equifax. So you get two credit score in one place. You can see where you're at and then start building on it. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything to, to set up your profile there. And if you need a small loan to get your business going, Prosper.com. Prosper.com, you can get a $10,000 to $30,000 loan to start building your business. This is how GCA got started. Even without having an invoice? It's, it's a personal loan. It's a personal loan. It's not a business loan. Okay. So when you apply, don't say it's for your business. When you apply on prosper.com, just say, hey, this is a personal loan to pay off some debt. Mm -hmm. So just do it for debt purposes. Mm -hmm. um, I remember PCA did it. Uh, credit score place? My credit score, I remember I filed bankruptcy. I told you that, I told everybody earlier, 
I filed business bankruptcy, personal bankruptcy. And a few years later, GCA, three years after that, I, I started GCA. And so my credit score was about, what was the lowest, 400? <laughs> it's as low as you can get, right? When you file bankruptcy and you lose your car, you lose your house, and you personally bankrupt and your business bankrupt, that's as low as you're gonna get, right? And so I slowly build my credit back up and GCA came around 2010. So, so uh, I started uh, the, my credit, my final um, bankruptcy was in 2008. So two and a half years later. And my credit score was like 640, but I got a $10,000 loan from Prosper. Five minutes, they will prove you in five minutes. And so if you don't learn anything from today, make sure you at least check that out to fund your business, to help it get to the next level. Now, if your credit score is 700 or more, they could, they will probably do 20, 30,000. But if you're less than 700, they'll probably do about 10,000. And it's a loan, it's not a line of credit. So they will, in, once you're approved, they ask for some documentation, and then once all the paperwork's in, less than a week later, they'll fund you your bank account. And then, uh, you know, they, they put you on a three-year payment plan. Really? Yep. The other the other way to do it is build a line of credit for your business. Credit cards. At a minimum, have some credit cards. Personal credit cards that you use for your business, or establish your business credit so you can get business uh, business credit cards as well. Usually for credit cards. Now these are easy ways of how you can start to build your your lines of credit and your business and get funding for your company, right? When I was helping one of the companies get their, you know, get their 8A, one of the questions in the 8A is, they, they ask about your financial strategy. Do you have any lines of credit? Because what the 8A SBA want to know is, if you want a contract, how are you going to fund your project? Right. And so for her, uh, all she had was a $3,500 um, Discover credit card. And that's what she had. And they approved her 8A because she had the line of credit. If you don't have a line of credit, they might not approve your 8A. I'm just telling you that in advance. It's not part of the requirements, but but the the requirement in the 8A is the the uh, the ability for this company to be sustainable in the 8A program. So that's one of the requirements. And if you don't have any credits, uh, lines of credit, then they may not approve you because of that there. And then you need mobilization fund. Now, the good thing is the SBA is creating a new mobilization capital program directly tied to government contracting. And so that should be available shortly. And so once we find out those details, we'll let everybody know. Uh, the other way of getting money is investor or partner. Investor or partner with money. So that's, that's, that's another way of how you can fund your business, right? Uh, one of the small companies that I work with, she, uh, you know, we helped her get going, and she won a sixty thousand dollar project. And so I said, hey, you know, you're able to fund this here, but what you really need is you need to really build for your future. And so I connected to a few people. She, you know, one of the company, one of the you know, person I connected to her uh, was interested in investing in a woman-owned business in a future eight A. She, she's not eight A yet. Investing in a future eight A company. And they invested twenty thousand dollars to her company so that she can get going. So sometime you know you might need a partner. All right. So past performance strategies. You're a past performance is defined as personal past performance and corporate past performance. In the government market, just like your personal credit score, in the government market they don't know who you are. They don't know your credit credibility. They don't know your history. So they use past performance as your credibility in the government market. And so they say, okay, what have you done? And so for you personally, you know, sometimes your resume is part of the proposal submission or one of your staff is part of the submission That's, that goes in your past performance. Most of the time, they, they work on, they're more concerned about corporate past performance. If you're a brand new company or if you're a young company and you don't have a lot of experience yet, how do you get past performance, right? 
strategies to get past performance. The best way is to, if you're looking for personal or people past performance, you get a contingency to hire. So you screen out some people and say, hey, are you willing to work for this project if we win? And they, and they say yes, and then you give them a contingency to hire a document and you submit it and the resume as part of the proposal package. So that's kind of how you get past performance for you before, from a personal perspective. But corporate past performance is you team, team with another company that have past performance. And so their past performance, you, you need to have a team agreement. Their past performance becomes your past performance. And so when you're writing your proposal, this is what you want to say. You want to say that the team of ABC and DEF, these two companies together have 60 years of experience and, and our team have these past performance. Now you don't want to say my company have these past performance because you're lying to the government and you can get in trouble for that. But if you're, if you word it that our team, two or three, you can have maybe three companies together, but I generally don't recommend any more than, you know, two is ideal, you and another company, because it can get messy with multiple companies. And so teaming allows their past performance to meet your past performance. Same thing with a joint venture. In a joint venture, the challenge with a joint venture, you actually have to form a new company. Um, so it's a bit more complex. So for most of you, do teaming. Now, another way to build past performance is just do some subcontracting work that we talked about earlier, right? Start doing some subcontracting work so you can get some experience so that uh, you can get into it and now you have your own corporate past performance. But the other way is to set up a mentor-protege relationship. In a mentor-protege relationship, if you are women-owned and the other comp the large company decides to take you to get into a relationship with you in a mentor-protege, that all of their past performance can become your past performance. If you have an 8A, if you have women owned, all your certification can become theirs also. But that's done through a joint venture. So that's not done through a team. That's usually done through, uh, some mental project is done through a team, but most of it is done through a joint venture. And so you set up a new company and the new company have the strength of all the of uh, the small and large company and have this you know and all the you know all the weaknesses can, of your small company is gone when you have a large company as your teaming partner or uh, joint venture partner all right so let's uh talk about few quick things your image your strategy in terms of creating a brand that is larger than life right let's talk about this quick because we're running out of time we talk about capability statement business cards professional capability degree videos um and then your marketing strategy, you got to think through how are you going to email these people? Because when you're emailing them, it's different from how you email in the commercial market. And, and, and who do you email, right? Contracting officer, that's who you're going to email. The small business specialists, they are the advocates that work in the agencies. Their job is to support small businesses, so you want to email them. You also want to email the program manager, the supervisors, those that actually work at the agencies itself. Because contract officer may not work, they work for on behalf of the agency, but they may not work in the agency. So contract officer may be separate from the agency itself. So these are the three core uh, government people that you need to email. And phone calls, you can call these same people. And when you call them, what do you say, right? That's all part of having a good strategy. Usually, I you know suggest email them first, and then when you call, don't call like when you call, don't say if I get a phone call and someone says, "May I speak to Mr. Sion?" What am I thinking automatically? Bill, <laughs> Bill collector. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, th that was back in my days in the uh, 2008, you know, during the bankruptcy Sorry. days. Yeah, but yeah. But when, when somebody calls, they say, this is, can I speak to Mr. Siong? I'm thinking it's a, it's a telemarketing call. But when, so when I call, I don't say, can I talk to Mr. Smith? When I call, it doesn't matter who answers the phone. If I'm calling John, right? Even if a woman answers the phone, I say, hey, John, how are you doing? So what's she gonna think? She said, oh, this is somebody John knows. And so I, I go by their first name because friends, 
use first name basis, right? Say, hey, John, how are you doing? You know, I don't say, may I speak to Mr. Smith? I say, hey, John, how are you doing? And she says, oh, this is not John. Let me put John on, right? Or they say, oh, who, who is this calling? I say, oh, you know, I'm a friend of John. I sent him an email. I just want to make sure he got it. You see how I can use the email as my, I don't have to answer anything else. I can avoid all the other tough questions when I say, oh, I just want to make sure John got my email because I'm calling about the email I sent to him. And usually that will work. That will get you through the gatekeeper and directly to John. That's one way. Now, ultimately, you want to have John's direct number so you can call directly and not to the main line. Um, but that's part of your, of your strategies. Marketing, you can go to FBO and also include yourself in the FBO list. Uh, add yourself as an interested vendor on FBO.gov. And some of you know how to do that. That's a whole class that I don't have time to teach you how to do that. But I'm going to at least give you the, the concept. When you log into FBO, in the, in the option there, you can add yourself as an interested vendor onto the, that project. And you use that for marketing purposes. And someone may call you and say, hey, I'm looking for a team partner in Georgia. I'm in California. If they see you as an interested vendor, you may not have the ability to bid on the project, but the other company need a small business to help team with in the local area. Uh, so that's a good way to market. And then you want to do appointments face to face. And, and then the way you do appointments, one way is to use debriefs. And then go to events, pre-bid conference. Be, you know, we're in the fiscal new year now, so between now and January, there's going to be a lot of events that you can start to go to. Relationship is building KLT, no like and trust. And it's all about relationship in the government market. And one way to do that is use a debrief. It opens up the doors for you. When you submit a proposal and you don't win, you have three days to ask for a debrief. Very important. So sometimes you write a proposal to an agency, even knowing that you're probably not gonna win. If you win, celebrate. If you don't win, use it as your door opener into the agency. And so when you ask for a debrief, they can give you three types of debrief. They can do an email debrief, they can do a phone call debrief, or they can do a face-to-face -face debrief. If you, when you ask for it, make sure it's done in writing through email. So you can have a record that you did ask for in three days. So they can't say, ah, oh, well, I'm just gonna, you know, I didn't do a debrief because you didn't ask for it in time. Or, or if you do verbal, they may say, well, I never got, you know, I forgot. And, you know, it, so if you, you can say, yeah, you know, I asked for it in, in three days and, and but it's how you ask for a debrief, right? If you sound like the angry black man, like Adam is every now and then, no? <laughs> Adam's pretty cool. He does, he never gets angry. I've never seen him, you know, get mad at his sister at any time. <laughs> <laughs> but, so your debrief is, is how you ask for the debrief. If you, if you, if you, if you get on the phone or send an email, say, hey, we, you know, I just got notified that we didn't win the contract. But we see that this is you know, your agency. You do a lot of construction work and work construction company, and we really want to work for you in the future. So I want to ask for a debrief, you know, about 15, 20 minutes of your time so I can learn what we did right, what we didn't do right on this project, and so that we can be better prepared for the future. If you do it like that, they're going to give you a face-to-face. -face. If you sound like you're crazy and you're upset that you didn't win the contract, they're going to send you an email that you didn't win because of this, and good luck. And that's that. So. All right, so relationship, we're running out of time, so I can't go to all these other details, uh, but this is a very important chart here. So these are all the relations you need to build. You as a contractor need to build a relationship with the end user, the contract officer, and the small business advocates. You also need a relationship with large, large businesses, small business, and your government department team. You got to build out your contracting team down there. This is everything about relationship that you need to know in the government market. And then you need to build, your government contract department team needs to look like this here. You need a capture manager. Right now, if you are a solopreneur, you are the capture manager. Uh, you need a cost estimator, researcher, finding bids and costing, costing out price of the projects. You need a brand manager, a marketer. You need a contract uh, manager. You need a contract specialist, compliance manager. You need a proposal writer. You need a legal team. Usually the compliance manager is a uh, accountant or a outsourced team. Legal team is usually outsourced to an attorney that understands government contracting and contracting law. But all of these people here, it comes out to $750,000. So as a small business, 
Can you afford that? So right now you're learning to wear all these hats. And that's that's what you're learning. And so give yourself a raise, okay? After today, you're worth seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. You're doing work for seven hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of people. So give yourself a raise, or at least take yourself out to a you know to Jeju and get a body massage or a scrub or something like that. You know, treat yourself out because you're doing a lot of hard work. Uh, I give you full permission to do that there. And then you gotta have a compliance plan, and you gotta understand the regulations, understand DCA compliance, uh, and get some legal help for your business. Uh huh. Where can we go to study the FAR regulations? The FAR? Uh, if you go to acquisition.gov, and uh, that will link you to the FAR. If you just Google Federal Acquisition Regulation, it will take you to that. It's a funky little link. And there's, you know, 52 or 53 parts to the FAR. And the main part to the FAR you want to read is FAR 19. FAR part 19 is the most important part. Um, there's a, all of it's important, but the most important, there's like two or three sections that's very important for small businesses. And FAR 19 is critical. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Closeout strategy, the key thing I want to say about your closeout strategy is making sure that the contracting officer you're working with is happy. Make sure they have a lot of paperwork they have to go through to close out the documents. And you have a little bit of work, so don't complain about your little paperwork that you have. They have this stack of paper, you have this stack of paper. So make sure that their job is easy and they're gonna be happy so that the next time there's a project at this, oh, this company was so easy to work with and they're gonna consider you for a social contract the next time around. Part of closeout is getting registered wide area workflow so that you can get paid. That's the invoicing system. And ultimately don't get listed in EPLS. And that's the excluded party list system. Make sure that everybody that you work with is happy so that you can qualify for the next project. At a minimum, you want a satisfactory completion of the project. All right, so Gloria, I want to wrap out a few, a few quick stories here. Gloria was sat in a chair just like many of you uh, not too long ago. She came, she was a brand new company, uh, didn't have any past performance, didn't have anything going on. And she came and you know, we talked about her logo and her website and all these different things from the ground up. So she went out and she's a foreign company, number one contract. Been trying to do it on her own for three years. Became a member, got through a coaching program. And in three months, she won two contracts. Now, she's abnormal, okay? Normally it takes three years. She's not normal. She's not normal. She's very normal. She, she's, she's, she's her, her, her work ethics and, and winning contracts in three months is not the normal. That's, that's, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. It's not her. It's not her. Yeah, it's not her. But Laura, is, you know, she worked her business and she came and put in place the things that we taught her and three months she won two contracts. 260000 with Camp de June up in North Carolina and 350000 uh, with Coweta County in south of, of Atlanta. And so she, she did that. This is my, uh, Barbara. Barbara, with her company is Amira. Took her 13 months to win her first contract. But she's 70, right now she's 74 years old. And so she retired as an educator, wanted to start her own company, and uh, worked with her. Her first contract was $25,000. This is Bonita. She went out there. She lives in South Carolina. She, worked, she had a full-time job like some of you. She tried to build her business on the side, had a full-time job, and in four months, she won a, her first contract, $24,000. Uh, shortly after that, another project for $229,000. And on that day, she sent me an email and said, hey, guess what? I just submitted my two weeks notice. And so she's, she's left her full-time job, and now she's building her businesses. Uh, this is Buki. Buki's in, uh, she started off as a SEO company, website development company, but she's growing to an IT company now. Uh, and part of that is not being a specialist, but become more of a generalist. So she, her, one of her first projects was uh, doing uh, ad advertising SEO marketing, which she has won that project 27 times. Each time is $60,000. So these prime came back to her over and over and over again. Uh, 
but this is like early this year, so it's probably about 30 times now that they've used her for this continuation of the same project over and over and so forth. Uh, she won a social contract. Um, she moved into a nice office now, so she's she's doing pretty well now. So. <laughs> So to, to, to wrap it up here, government is different and, and you need to have the right strategies to be successful in it. And you need to have the right tools. And so one of the tools that we develop is a government contract and blueprint. So in this blueprint here, we call it our, it, it covers a step-by-step, -step, it's a software, it takes you step-by-step, -step, how to register for time, everything, all the strategies we talk about is in the software. And we take you through the registration process, the certification, proposal templates, team agreement samples, uh, HR employee handbook sample, uh, a cybersecurity, you know, cyber plan example, all kinds of different templates in here. And we talk about capability statement. We put capability statement samples in here, uh, you know, a capability brief, website, all of that's in the software here. And we did all that so that it can be easy for you because we talk about a lot of strategies today, right? Some of you are feeling like, oh, it's a little overwhelmed already. But in the Gut Fast Track, we actually cover 972 steps, step, step by step by step with templates, resources, and so forth. And for all of you who are members, this is available to you for $999 to make it easy for you. Uh, it includes your contacting assessment kit, your quick start kit, it includes your success kit, and it includes your marketing kit. All of that is in the software. But you get it through, it's, a, it's an online app. So it's, it's an online web tool, but that we also have an app. So you can actually pull it on your cell phone and work through it. And so that it, it, it becomes your blueprint in the government market. So we, I want to invite all of you uh, to talk to me to get this here. If you want to do more research on it, go to govfasttrack.com and read up on it. Uh, it's the most powerful tool. If there's anything you invest in in your government contracting journey, this is one of those tools that you want to invest in. And all of the companies that I share with you that we have helped win contract, all of them have used this software here. Now, I'm not saying you can't win a contract without this, this blueprint here but it saves you a lot of time, a lot of headache, and you can do it faster. So that's, this allows you, that's what we call a fast track. So it's, it's really about how can you do it as fast as possible. Instead of taking three years, you can do it a lot faster through a tool like this here. All right, so this is all I have. I appreciate everybody coming me out. Any last minute question before we wrap up here? All of you online, any questions from those of you online? Uh, if you in the chat area, if you have a question, put in the chat area and then uh, I will answer your questions if you're online. So one of the questions, is there a minimum revenue requirement in order to apply uh, for the 8A? That's a good question. So the, for 8A program, you must have revenue. If you don't have revenue, don't apply for the 8A certification. But there is no minimum requirement for the 8A program. One of the companies I helped get into the 8A, she had her first year was 10,000. And that was like, she was doing uh, a Schedule C, you know, full-time employee somewhere else, but she started her business. And so she wasn't even fully incorporated yet. It was self-employment at that point. Um, and so she, you know, first year it was 10,000 revenue, the second year was like 25,000. And then we, she formed her company in the second year. And then, you know, and the, but because she had two years of revenue, by her third year, we actually applied for the 8A. And even though she wasn't officially formed two years in business, but she was operating, you know, two years before, we were able to get into the 8A program, you know, $20,000 of revenue. But it, it should look like 10, 20,000. Another company, he was doing millions, but his revenue was million, 700,000, 500,000. And if you're going in that direction, they may not approve you to the aided program as well. So, so, but there's no minimum requirement. Any other question? All right, well, hey, thanks so much everybody. Uh, next Wednesday, we're gonna be right back here for another class. So 10.30 again next Wednesday. Uh, look forward to seeing everybody back here.